Welcome to this video on common ECG abnormalities, where we're going to cover the important ECG pathologies that you might come across in medical school exams and clinical practice. If you haven't already, I'd recommend watching the first two ECG videos in this series. The commonest ECG you will come across, particularly in clinical practice, is sinus rhythm, i.e. a normal ECG. This is characterized by a regular rhythm with each wave of depolarization originating from the cyanoatrial node. This is what we see in a healthy individual without pathology. Being able to recognize a normal ECG is essential as it allows you to know when something is abnormal. You will commonly see ECGs that show tachycardia or a heart rate above 100 beats per minute. We're going to have a look at some common tachyarrhythmia ECGs specifically sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. Sinus tachycardia, similar to sinus rhythm, is where the rhythm is arising from the sinoatrial node, but the rate is over 100 beats per minute. There are many causes for this, including hypovolemia, pain, anxiety, or a pulmonary embolus. Notice the short RR intervals, which demonstrate tachycardia. If you do the calculation of 300 divided by the number of large squares in the RR interval, you'll get a rate of around 150. Atrial fibrillation often presents with tachycardia. It occurs when there's chaotic electrical activity coming from the atria often derived from the roots of the pulmonary veins, rather than the SA node. Two distinctive features that allow you to identify AF is the absence of P waves throughout the ECG and an irregularly irregular rhythm, which means an irregular rhythm with no obvious pattern or predictability. You may also see fibrillatory waves along the isoelectric line. Be careful not to confuse these for P waves or you may miss the diagnosis. Also, notice on this ECG how the QRS complexes are narrower than 0.12 seconds, or three small squares. This is an indicator that the arrhythmia is arising from above the ventricles. In other words, it's a supraventricular arrhythmia. AF is often a tachyarrhythmia, with rates often varying from 110 to 160. However, the rate can also be normal, or bradycardic. This is often seen when patients are on rate control medications, such as beta blockers. Ventricular tachycardia is a tachyarrhythmia where the waves originate from the ventricles, rather than a supraventricular rhythm as seen in AF. We can see this in the wide QRS complexes, although I appreciate that the QRS complexes in VT look very different than other ECGs. The commonest form of VT is monomorphic VT, where the waves of depolarization originate from a single point in the ventricles. Because of this, each successive complex looks the same. This is often caused by myocardial ischemia or cardiomyopathies. Polymorphic VT refers to those arrhythmias where the wave of depolarization arises from multiple foci in the ventricles. This gives complexes that are different in their amplitude and axis. The commonest cause for this, again, is myocardial ischemia. Where VT is present for prolonged periods of time, there's a serious risk of degeneration into ventricular fibrillation and then cardiac arrest. A specific form of polymorphic VT that you should be able to recognize is torsades de point. This usually develops due to a prolonged QT interval. It has this characteristic shape where the complexes appear to twist around the isoelectric line. Translated from French, torsades de poids literally means twisting of peaks. This is very serious and can also quickly lead to ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest. Ventricular fibrillation is the last of the tachyarrhythmias we're going to cover. 
it's characterized as chaotic electrical activity from the ventricular myocytes. This is an essential ECG to recognize, as it often leads to cardiac arrest. In the context of exams, this is quite an easy one to recognize due to its chaotic appearance of fibrillatory waves. The vignette in an exam will most likely describe a patient who is unconscious or in cardiac arrest. A good way to remember the difference between VF and VT on an ECG is to think of VF as very funny and VT as very tidy. This is a good descriptor of what the ECGs look like. Next are our bradycardias, where the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute. First is sinus bradycardia, which is a slow heart rate with normal rhythm arising from the SA node. This is just a slow sinus rhythm. There are many possible causes for this, including medications such as beta blockers, increased vagal tone as seen in athletes, or it could be a late sign of hemorrhage. Notice here that there's an increased RR interval. If you use the equation 300 divided by the number of large squares between the RR interval, you'll get a rate of less than 50 beats per minute. AV blocks can also result in bradycardia. The term AV block is used synonymously with heart block. It's a result of impaired conduction through the atrioventricular node. First degree AV block means the PR interval is over 0.2 seconds, or five small squares. The increased PR interval represents a delay in conduction from the atria to the ventricles. If the patient is hemodynamically stable and asymptomatic, then this is often an incidental finding with no treatment required. Second degree AV block can have two types. The first is called Mobitz 1, or Wenkerbach phenomenon, where the PR interval elongates with each successive complex until eventually a QRS is dropped. In this condition, the AV node is tiring with each conduction until eventually it fails to conduct and then resets. Similar to first degree AV block, this is often an asymptomatic and benign condition. Mobitz type 2 also has QRS complexes missed, but with a constant PR interval, there will still be P waves at regular intervals. This is a result of the Hispokinji system not conducting as it should. Mobitz 2 can cause hemodynamic instability and lead to third degree AV block. In third degree AV block, there is no communication between the atria and ventricles, so each is producing their own waves of depolarization, which are out of sync with one another. Because of this, you have regular P waves and regular QRS complexes, but they are not in sync. This can lead to sudden cardiac death, so it requires pacing. Next, we're going to look at ischemic changes that you can see on the ECG associated with myocardial infarction, also known as a heart attack. First we'll look at STEMIs, then bundle branch blocks. A STEMI, or ST elevation myocardial infarction, occurs when there is ischemia across the full thickness of the myocardium. Have a look at this ECG and appreciate how leads 2, 3, AVF and V4 all have ST elevation. ST elevation is significant if it's greater than 1 mm in two or more contiguous limb leads, or greater than 2 mm in two or more contiguous chest leads. There are other ECG features that can also represent myocardial ischemia, including T wave inversion, tall T waves, ST depression, and left bundle branch block. An NSTEMI is a myocardial infarction without ST elevation, which may or may not contain some of these secondary features. T wave inversion can be normal in leads 3, EVR, and V1. However, notice in this ECG the T wave inversion in AVL. 
the location of the ST elevation can tell us where in the myocardium the ischemia is coming from, and therefore which coronary artery is likely affected. Leads V1 to V4 are anterior leads, which are usually supplied by the left anterior descending artery. Leads 1, AVL, V5 and V6 are lateral leads supplied by the circumflex coronary artery. And leads 2, 3 and AVF are inferior leads representing the right coronary artery. Bundle branch block can also be a sign of ischemia and represents delayed conduction of depolarization through the bundle of Hiss. This can affect either the left bundle branch or right bundle branch. The ECG will show a wide QRS complex, i.e. more than 0.12 seconds or three small squares. A left bundle branch block will show a W shape in V1 and an M shape in V6, which can be remembered using the name William. Right bundle branch block will give the opposite, with an M shape in QRS V1 and W shape in V6, remembered by marrow. It's also important to be able to recognise electrolyte disturbances on the ECG. We're going to cover two common ones, hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia. Hyperkalemia has the classic ECG feature of tall, tented T waves, which are quite pronounced in this ECG. This is often an early sign of hyperkalemia. With more pronounced hyperkalemia, patients may develop a prolonged PR interval and P wave flattening. As hyperkalemia progresses, patients can develop bradyarrhythmias, or VF, eventually leading to asystole. The causes of hyperkalemia can be remembered using the mnemonic DRED, which stands for diabetic ketoacidosis, renal failure, either from AKI or CKD, endocrine, which is often Addison's disease, artifact, which means a falsely high potassium reading, or drugs, such as ACE inhibitors and potassium sparing diuretics. Hypocalcemia is typically associated with a prolonged QT interval. A normal QT interval is less than 440 milliseconds in males or 460 milliseconds in females. Remember, it's important to use the corrected QT interval, for example, using Bazet's formula, to account for changes in heart rate that may mask a prolonged QT interval. This ECG has a corrected QT interval are 447 seconds. So this would be slightly prolonged in a male patient, but normal in a female. It's unlikely that you'd be asked to calculate the corrected QT interval using one of these formulas in a medical school exam. But just be aware that they exist and know how to measure a basic QT interval. A severely raised QT interval is dangerous as it can lead to torsades de point and eventually asystole. Causes of hypocalcemia include hypoparathyroidism, low magnesium, use of bisphosphonates, and renal failure. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.